Well, we knew it was gonna end up in front of the Supreme Court at some point, but SCOTUS may decide this sooner rather than later, and that's good news for some and bad news for others. Now, Donald Trump basically says that the Constitution gave him absolute power to do whatever he wanted as president and without criminal prosecution. Then I have an Article 2 where I have the right to do whatever I want as president. And former President Trump has asked an appeals court to dismiss one of the criminal indictments against him because of this alleged presidential immunity. But special counsel Jack Smith has now answered Trump's claim with a petition for certiorari that might as well be entitled, that's not how this works, that's not how any of this works. And Smith doesn't want to waste any time. He wants the Supreme Court to decide this issue without waiting around for an appellate decision. So can Trump be tried, convicted, and punished for acts he committed while president, or is he absolutely immune from federal prosecutions for these alleged crimes? And what is the Supreme Court going to do about it? Now, on August 1st, 2023, a federal grand jury in Washington, D.C. indicted Donald Trump on four counts of attempting to interfere in the 2020 election. The indictment alleges that while Trump was still president, he participated in a conspiracy to defraud the United States, that he corruptly obstructed the certification of the presidential election results on January 6, 2021, and that he conspired with other people to do the same, and that he violated one or more persons' constitutional rights to vote and have their vote counted. Now, federal district court judge Tanya Chutkin scheduled the trial to begin on March 4, 2024, but Trump recently filed a motion to dismiss the indictment on the grounds that he has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for acts taken within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities, and that the indictment's allegations all fall within that scope. Trump also argued that double jeopardy principles and the impeachment clause barred his prosecution. Smith opposed Trump's motion on the grounds that a president does not have absolute immunity from federal criminal prosecution. The district court denied Trump's immunity claim and rejected the impeachment clause argument. Trump filed a notice of appeal to the DC circuit and moved for stay of all proceedings in the district court while his appeal was pending. And under federal law and Supreme Court precedent, an appeal suspends trial proceedings, specifically anything, quote, involved in the appeal. So I think in an abundance of caution, Judge Chutkin has now halted most aspects of the case, although we don't know exactly how much of the case is halted and for how long. Trump's appeal on the immunity issue is an interlocutory appeal. An interlocutory appeal is an appeal uh, to the Court of Appeals before a conviction or a sentence. And federal procedure states, quote, the filing of a notice of appeal confers jurisdiction on the courts of appeal and divests the district court of its control over those aspects of the case involved in the appeal. So consequently, Judge Chuckin's order pauses any further proceedings that would move the case towards trial or impose additional burdens of litigation on defendant. However, her order is limited in two respects. First, the state deadlines and proceedings are held in abeyance rather than permanently vacated. And Judge Chuckin said she would release the March trial date if jurisdiction were returned to her. Uh, second, the court's other protective measures are not in abeyance, which means that Trump still has to follow his pretrial release conditions and the judge's gag orders. The judge also said her protective orders uh, guiding discovery and jury procedures are still active, and it's theoretically possible the entire criminal prosecution of Trump is not necessarily stayed. There's case law stating that an appeal only divests the federal court over control of, as I said, those aspects of the case involved in the appeal. Here, that could mean the rest of the case continues to move forward, but as Judge Chuckin notes, there is no circuit precedent on the court's protective orders, quote, much less instructive cases in the context of an interlocutory immunity appeal. Uh, the Supreme Court recently stayed an arbitration case in its entirety because, quote, the question on appeal is whether the case belongs in arbitration or instead in district court. Uh, the entire case is essentially involved in the appeal. So here we don't know exactly what a claim of presidential immunity will do to the case as a whole, but clearly there will be delays in some respects. Now, obviously you're gonna want a good lawyer to argue in front of the Supreme Court, but if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you've been in a car crash, suffered a data breach, or have a workers' comp or social security disability issue, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney who can. It's always important to talk to a lawyer right away so you can get the best representation and find out what your options are. So just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. Link is below. But rather than wait for the appeals court to rule, Smith filed a petition for certiorari requesting that the Supreme Court expedite Trump's appeal from the district court order. And Trump opposes this motion even though he wants the case dismissed. Now, if this appeal goes forward on an ordinary or even expedited timeline, the Supreme Court would not decide it until probably next term in 2025. And barring something completely unforeseen, Trump will be the Republican Party's nominee for president. Then if Trump is elected, he might argue that the case can't move forward because sitting presidents can't be prosecuted, or he might just dismiss the case himself. So the first question is, can Smith bypass the Court of Appeals? Uh, Trump world has reacted to Smith's move with the typical understatement. For example, quote, crooked Joe Biden's henchman deranged Jack Smith is so obsessed with interfering in the 2024 presidential election with the goal of preventing President Trump from retaking the Oval Office, as the president is poised to do, that Smith is willing to try for a Hail Mary by racing to the Supreme Court and attempting to bypass the appellate process. But in opposing the government's motion, Trump complains that it took too long for the government to prosecute him, so now the court should take as long as possible to dismiss the case against him. Quote, the prosecution waited over two years 
lawyers to bring this lawless case, and then sought an extraordinarily expedited trial calendar, demanding the jury selection begin in December 2023. Notwithstanding, there is a process by which the Supreme Court can weigh in before an appeals court renders a decision. Federal law says, quote, an application for the Supreme Court for a writ of certiorari to review a case before judgment has been rendered in the Court of Appeals may be made at any time before judgment. And when is it okay to ask for an expedited review of this type? Well, when, quote, the case is of such imperative public importance as to justify deviation from normal appellate practice and to require immediate determination in the court. And rather than being a liberal conspiracy, it's a process by which the Supreme Court can issue a decision without having to wait for the lower court of appeals, often when things are incredibly important for the country, and also when it doesn't make any sense to wait for the court of appeals if the Supreme Court is going to have the final word on the decision anyway. Smith argues that this is obviously a case of imperative public importance. The amenability to criminal prosecution of a former president of the United States for conduct undertaken during his presidency. It requires no extended discussion to confirm that this case involving charges that respondents sought to thwart the peaceful transfer of power through violations of federal criminal law is at the apex of public importance. The charges implicate a central tenet of our democracy. And there is some precedent to support the idea of the court acting quickly to resolve a claim of presidential immunity. As uh, the government wrote in its briefing, quote, when the government sought certiorari before judgment in the United States versus Nixon, a case presenting similarly consequential issues of presidential privilege, the court granted the petition and resolved the constitutional question expeditiously so that the trial could begin as scheduled. And in the Nixon case, the court granted certain issued an opinion just 16 days later, in part so that one of the Watergate criminal trials could proceed. Smith argues that, quote, this is a quintessential example of an important question of federal law that has not been, but should be settled by this court. And the Supreme Court has never directly addressed criminal immunity, even though it comes up every time a sitting president orchestrates a burglary, has sex with an intern, or tries to overthrow the elected government. And Trump's lawyers responded by accusing Jack Smith of trying to cancel Christmas and scolding the special counsel for trying to make the court staff miserable during the holidays. That's not a joke. That's actually what they wrote in their briefing, quote, it's as if the special counsel growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming, but how? Now that's probably not what I would write in my own Supreme Court briefing, but you gotta hand it to him. It's uh, memorable at least. And Trump argues that the March 2024 trial date itself is unconstitutional and that the public interest weighs strongly against the request for expedited review. Trump contends that expedited consideration would violate President Trump's due process and Sixth Amendment rights among others. And he argues that it would deprive him of the time necessary to prepare his defense since the case includes 11.5 million pages of discovery. Though this does ignore an important fact, which is that the immunity issue is largely a matter of law, not fact. And if the Supreme Court agrees with Trump that he is immune from prosecution, then there's no need to read the 11.5 million pages of documents because the case would be over. And the Supreme Court quickly agreed to expedite consideration of Smith's petition. Now, this is not the same thing as agreeing to decide the case before the appeals court makes a decision. This is a decision to decide whether to decide that case up front. Uh, and uh, Smith is taking nothing for granted. He can currently file a motion to expedite proceedings in the DC circuit, asking for an expedited schedule that will ensure that a decision is made fast enough that the Supreme Court would hear it during the current term. The DC federal appeals court granted the government's request to expedite consideration of Trump's appeal. And the appeals court has set deadlines for briefs to be filed between December 23rd and January 2nd. Now, what about the merits of the case? Well, American presidents enjoy absolute immunity from most civil lawsuits involving conduct that occurred during their presidential terms. The constitution does not explicitly say that the president actually has any litigation immunity because of his role as chief executive, but this immunity exists by judicial interpretation. And in practice, it means that a president is given the freedom to exercise his official duties without being exposed to litigation for civil damages. And in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, a five to four Supreme Court ruled that a president is entitled to absolute immunity from legal liability for civil damages based on his official acts, including acts on the outer perimeter of his duties. The court defined the president's official duties quite broadly to prevent future presidents from being sued for quote, virtually every allegation that an action was unlawful or was taken for a forbidden purpose. Now the contours of immunity from civil liability are still being defined. In Clinton versus Jones, the Supreme Court gave Paula Jones the green light to sue Bill Clinton for sexual harassment that happened before he was president. And when E. Jean Carroll sued Trump for defamation after he said that she lied about sexual assault, he asserted that he had immunity because he called her a liar while he was president and his statements were included in the outer perimeter of his official duties. But last week, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that Trump waived immunity the first time a court has held that presidential immunity was waivable. And Trump also raised immunity as defense to lawsuits filed by Capitol Police officers and members of Congress who assert uh, that Trump incited a riot on January 6th, but a three-judge panel of the DC Circuit rejected this claim. 
The court held that Trump's remarks on that day were not necessarily within the outer perimeter of his official acts. It's possible that they were, and it's possible that they weren't. That will have to be decided at trial. And when he acts outside of the functions of his office, he does not continue to enjoy immunity from damages liability just because he happens to be president. Rather, as the Supreme Court made clear in Clinton versus Jones, a president's official act immunity by nature does not extend to his unofficial actions. When he acts in an unofficial private capacity, he is subject to civil suits like any private citizen. But the bigger question is what about criminal liability for acts which occurred during the presidency? Now, Donald Trump wants the same circuit court that decided the Capitol Police case to rule that he can't be criminally prosecuted for anything he did while president. Now, no court has ever ruled that a sitting president is immune from all criminal liability while president. However, uh, Trump is arguing a school of thought known as the unitary executive theory. And this theory was largely developed by Antonin Scalia while he served in the Nixon administration. Now, according to this theory, every power not expressly granted to the judiciary or the legislature is given to the president as part of his duties to faithfully execute the law. And it postulates that the entire federal government serves at the command of the president, and neither Congress nor the courts have a right to check the president's orders. And there are some scholars that extend the unitary executive theory to make the president immune from criminal prosecution. However, there have been some roadblocks to this idea. For example, in 2020, the Supreme Court ruled against Trump's version of the unitary executive theory in a case where he challenged New York's right to subpoena his business records for alleged financial crimes. In Trump versus Vance, the court rejected the proposition that a sitting president uh, can use his powers under Article II of the Constitution to assert immunity from criminal investigation. Then in Trump versus Mazars, the Supreme Court ruled that the president wasn't immune from congressional subpoenas. Investigation is different from prosecution, though. The Justice Department has long taken the position that a sitting president could be investigated but not charged with a crime until after he leaves office. Uh, this is why Robert Mueller's team prosecuted Trump's associates but did not charge Trump with crimes. Though the Justice Department's reasoning doesn't have the force of law and the analysis is a bit shaky. However, even the DOJ agrees that a president can be prosecuted after his term ends. But former President Trump has gone a step further in asserting that a former president can never face criminal prosecution for acts that they did while president unless they were impeached and convicted uh, in Congress. Now, Judge Chutkin has rejected this out of hand. Quote, the Constitution's text, structure, and history do not support that contention. No court or any other branch of government has ever accepted it, and this court will not so hold. Whatever immunities a sitting president may enjoy, the United States has only one chief executive at a time, and that position does not confer a lifelong get-out-of-jail-free pass. Former presidents enjoy no special conditions on their federal criminal liability. Defendant may be subject to federal investigation, indictment, prosecution, conviction, and punishment for any criminal acts undertaken while in office. And in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court previously affirmed that there is no provision in the Constitution conferring criminal immunity. And a memo from the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel confirms that, quote, the Constitution provides no explicit immunity from criminal sanctions for any civil officer, including the current president. And it appears the framers of the Constitution included immunity for other federal officials, such as members of Congress, who are protected by the speech and debate clause, but they didn't give this kind of immunity to the president. And as for Trump's assertion that the impeachment judgment clause grants him immunity, uh, this clause says, quote, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. Now, Trump says this means that he can't be indicted, convicted, or punished unless the Senate convicted him at his impeachment trial. Uh, Judge Chutkin so far has said that the first part of the clause was meant to distinguish the presidency from British tradition in which an impeachment conviction could result in additional penalties like fines and even execution. And the second part of the impeachment clause that says the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law, uh, Judge Chutkin concluded that this means that further punishment by the courts is possible. Uh, Trump argues that it's only possible if the president is in fact convicted during impeachment. And while Trump's argument already has traction with Justice Alito, who discussed it in a dissent in Trump versus Vance, uh, Judge Chuckin wrote that even if Trump's interpretation was valid, it would only protect the president while he was in office, which has been the OLC's position since the Nixon era. And Trump's argument would undermine accountability for other law-breaking officials because it would, quote, apply not only to the president, but also the vice president and all civil officers of the United States who may likewise be impeached. And the order discusses the history of criminality by executive officials. Vice President Aaron Burr was indicted even though his impeachment trial did not end in conviction. Vice President Spiro Agnew was indicted despite not being impeached and eventually resigning and entering a no contest plea. And in one of the more ridiculous incidences in presidential history, President Grant was cited for reckless driving of horses uh, and then the next day he did it again. An, an officer arrested and fined Grant, but Grant did not argue that he was immune from prosecution. 
Uh, prior cases deciding issues of presidential immunity addressed the Article II interests of the presidency. For example, Nixon versus Fitzgerald was about a president allegedly injuring individuals who had to sue for damages. But both the DOJ's legal team and the Trump legal team are gonna need a lot of coffee over the holidays to write their briefs, do right before Christmas and right after New Year's. Luckily, they can get some great coffee from today's sponsor, Trade Coffee. Trade's great because not only do they have a huge selection of your favorite coffees, but they have a fine tuning matching process that helps you discover fresh coffee based on your taste preferences. Oh, hey, and this holiday season, Trade is the perfect gift for any coffee lover. There's two ways you can gift Trade. You can gift a subscription or a gift box like this one. Uh, for a coffee subscription, all you have to do is choose how much you want to spend, meaning the number of bags of coffee that your friend or loved one will receive, and then you can personalize the rest with Trade's Coffee Quiz. Or you can get a coffee gift box. I can personally tell you that the gift boxes uh, are amazing. I got one with uh, chocolate chili and caramel syrup. Usually caramel syrup tastes like artificial goo, but this stuff is so incredible. I'm actually surprised that there's any of it left because I was fully willing to swig it directly. And then the bag of coffee it came with was great. It matched the syrups perfectly. Now I have very specific tastes in coffee. I basically want something that tastes like hot chocolate and pairs well with milk. And Trade is always able to find me the perfect bean. And let's be honest, you claim you want a rich dark roast, but you really want a coffee milkshake. But either way, Trade has you covered. And if you already know what you like, then they probably already have your favorite roaster in stock at a great price. You can even choose whole beans or your preferred grind. You can get it delivered straight to your door or straight to the door of a lucky friend or loved one. So if you love coffee or are looking for a great gift this holiday season, try Trade Coffee. All you have to do is click on the link in the description or the one that's on screen right now. And not only will you get your first bag free, you'll also get free shipping. So get your first bag free by clicking on the link on screen. And of course, you have all the gift bag and gift subscription options too. So click on the link to check it out. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.